Today's lecture is going to be about tsunami. If you've noticed all of the previous things that we talked about, whether it was earthquakes or volcanic eruptions or landslides, I always said, and they can cause tsunami. Well, today we're going to look in more detail at how each one of these events can be a trigger of a tsunami. But before we get to that, I want to start with a hazard map. Just like all the other lectures, let's take a look at, in the United States, who is most at risk of one of these events. And this is um, actually a map showing past tsunami events that have occurred to give you an idea of um, how often these, these areas are impacted. So this map is showing seven earthquake-generated tsunami events in the United States from nine, the year 900 to nine, 1964. So we've got about a thousand years there. The uh, earthquakes that cause these tsunamis are, uh, in red, the Prince William Sound tsunami. You can see that affected, uh, well, Prince William Sound is in uh, Alaska. That affected the coast of Alaska and um, the west coast of, uh, of the U.S., California, Oregon, and Washington. We also have the 1960 uh, uh, Chilean tsunami. Uh, th this was triggered by the largest earthquake ever recorded. And uh, you can see that that tsunami impacted the Hawaiian Islands significantly. Uh, we have the 1946 Alaska earthquake, which hit the um, uh, west coast. Um, Puerto Rico has had a uh, tsunami hit them because there is si some seismicity there in the uh, Caribbean. Uh, the Virgin Islands have also been hit because of uh, Caribbean seismicity. Um, Cascadia is uh, a fault zone up here. It's a subduction zone off the coast of um, um, the Pacific Northwest, Washington and Oregon. You can see that uh, triggered a uh, tsunami in 1700. That tsunami actually traveled all the way across the Pacific and hit Japan. And then there's one from about 900 AD that hit uh, just the Puget Sound area. And so this really gives you an idea of um, the places that are most likely to have tsunami tend to be uh, in the Pacific, right? Alaska, Hawaii, California, Oregon, Washington. But that doesn't mean places in the Caribbean can't have a tsunami. And, as we're going to find out today, it also doesn't mean that the Atlantic is free from um, tsunami hazard. In fact, any coastline has the potential of having a tsunami. It's just that some coastal areas are more likely to have tsunami occur than others. If you drive along the um, uh, west coast, of uh, the United States, you go drive along uh, parts of Oregon or Washington, you'll see a lot of signs like this. You see these also in Hawaii as well, where they say entering tsunami zone or leaving tsunami hazard zone. And that's because many of these areas have tsunami warning systems where um, they'll have sirens go off to let you know if there's a tsunami uh, coming and you need to leave the tsunami hazard zone. And why do you need to leave? Well, let's just see what kind of damage tsunami can actually cause. This is uh, Banda Aceh in, uh, in Indonesia. And uh, this was before the 2004 tsunami, and this is after. You can just see the complete uh, everything is gone from there because of that tsunami wave that arrived. So let's talk a little bit about tsunami and how they work and, and how we can forecast them. All right, tsunami is actually a Japanese term and it means harbor wave because the Japanese noticed that these waves became more focused and larger. They'd grow bigger and bigger, especially in harbors and in bays where things where the water was constricted a little bit more. And so, before we go into a tsunami wave, let's talk about your average run-of-the-mill waves that occur in the ocean, and then we can see how tsunami are different. 
Let's look at the parts of a typical water wave. We have the crest is the high point, the trough is the lowest point. When you measure from the trough to the crest, that's the wave height. You can measure the wave length from crest to the next crest of the wave. And the water in a typical wave moves in what's called an orbital motion. That means it's kind of a circular motion. And you'll notice this if you swim out and you're kind of bobbing in the waves or you throw some driftwood or something in the water. It doesn't move straight along the wave. It kind of goes forward, it drops down, and comes back up. Well, in the, the water molecules in the wave, all are moving with this orbital motion, but it gets less and less and less as we move downwards. And eventually, we'll reach a point where there's no more movement because of the wave, and that is called wave base. And wave base is always going to be about half the wavelength. So if you have a 10-foot wavelength, you're going to have a 5-foot wave base. And if you ever go scuba diving, you'll notice as you're right at the surface, you'll feel this kind of up and down movement of the waves. And then as you dive a bit deeper, you're not going to feel that anymore. And that's because you have gone below wave base. So th that's your typical water waves. Now, as your typical water waves come on shore, Right? So here we see that orbital motion. There's wave base. As those typical water waves move on shore, eventually wave base is going to hit the bottom, right? Because, you know, the water is getting shallower and shallower. When wave base hits um, the, uh, uh, the bottom of the ocean, when it hits the, the, the sea floor, this ends up slowing down the wave. And so the wavelength actually decreases, but the wave height increases. And this is why if you go to the, uh, the beach and you watch the waves coming in, you're going to see this point somewhere out there where the waves start growing up, right? They start getting a little bit higher. That's where wave base hits the bottom. And then they grow up higher and then they curl over as your breakers. And that's our typical waves coming in at the beach. A tsunami wave, however, is different. A tsunami always feels bottom. Well, why is that? It's because the wavelength of a tsunami is up to 500 kilometers long. And remember, wave base is half of wavelength. So if the wavelength is 500 kilometers, the wave base is 250 kilometers. Our oceans are not 250 kilometers deep. Um, in fact, uh, the average depth is something like, uh, I don't know, five or six kilometers deep, something like that. Uh, so the tsunami is always feeling bottom. Now, this is going to become important later on when we talk about forecasting tsunami and getting warnings for a tsunami. Now, another thing that makes tsunami special and different from the normal waves that we see at the beach, its velocity is incredibly fast. The velocity can be up to about 500 miles per hour, but it's actually usually a little bit slower than that because since it's feeling bottom, there's some friction exerted on the waves, slowing it down. So most are actually more like about, you know, 400 to 480 kilometers, give or take a little bit. But still, these are incredibly fast waves. Now, we make it sound often like a tsunami is a single wave, like the tsunami swept on shore and, and destroyed everything. Well, that's not exactly the way they work. It's actually a series of waves that come on shore, and they're separated by anywhere from about 10 to 60 minutes. And that's, again, because they have this long wavelength. That's why the waves might be as much as an hour apart. Um, so it's not a single wave that arrives, but it's a series of these really big, strong waves that arrive. The largest wave is random. 
So it's not like the first wave is the biggest, or the third wave is always the biggest. Sometimes it's the second, sometimes it's the fourth, uh, sometimes it's the first. Uh, so you can't be like, oh, I survived the first, everything's going to be fine, because um, the next one that arrives could be even worse. This is, uh, in fact, a um, water level gauge of the tsunami that hit um, Hilo, Hawaii in 1960. And we can see here's our, our normal level. And there's the first wave of the tsunami. There's the second one. And there's the third one. You see, in the case of this particular event, the third one ended up being the largest one. But this does nicely show you that the tsunami event is a series of these large waves that arrive. Now, like other waves, as the tsunami gets into the shallower water, more friction is exerted on it, the wavelength is going to decrease, and the wave height is going to increase. So if you are in a, uh, in a ship in the middle of the ocean and a tsunami passes you, you probably won't even know it because it's going to have uh, not much of a wave height out in the deep ocean. It's only when it starts approaching land that it starts growing uh, to uh, much greater heights. All right, so now that we have our kind of basic tsunami uh, uh, theory down, let's take a look at some of the causes of tsunami. And the most common cause of tsunami are earthquakes. So pretty much most of the tsunami you're going to hear about were generated by earthquakes. However, remember when we looked at the earthquake monitor and it's like every day there's lots and lots of earthquakes and every day we don't get lots and lots of tsunami? And it's because not every earthquake is going to generate a tsunami. Uh, there's certain things. And I didn't write it down here, um, but number one is the earthquake needs to be underwater. You could have the world's biggest earthquake happen in Kansas, and you are not getting a tsunami from that because there's no water there. Uh, so it does have to be underwater, but an additional thing is it must be a strong earthquake. We need something that's greater than typically a magnitude 7 earthquake. And that's a slight fib because, yes, a magnitude 5 earthquake could cause a tsunami, but the tsunami that arrives from the magnitude 5 earthquakes like this big, so people don't really care. Um, so it needs to be greater than magnitude 7 to create a tsunami that we need to worry about, like a big tsunami. All right, the other thing about uh, an earthquake to make a tsunami, it needs to have a shallow focus. Remember the origin of your earthquake is the focus and that focus can be anywhere from the surface to 660 kilometers deep. Well, it's got to have a shallow focus because the sea floor must move, right? You have to have a rise or fall of the sea floor. If the sea floor doesn't move because the earthquake was 600 kilometers underground, you don't get a tsunami. The thing you need to make a tsunami is you need to move a lot of water. And so in the case of an earthquake, part of the seafloor moves suddenly and pushes all of this water upwards. And when that water has to level back out, that's the tsunami that's created. So we need this shallow focus. And these tsunami that are caused by earthquakes, they're most common in subduction zones where you have reverse faults. So remember with a reverse fault, one side moves up suddenly, if it moves up suddenly, it's pushing that water. So we have this nice little diagram right here showing us what's going on. We have our fault here, and one side of the fault suddenly moves upward. It pushes all the water above it upwards, and the tsunami is the wave leveling back out, right? It's, it's leveling the seawater out. That's what's creating the tsunami. So we must have this earthquake move the sea floor and move the water above it. And that's how earthquakes cause tsunami. 
Now, some notable earthquake-induced tsunami are the one that hit Indonesia back in 2004. The earthquake was a magnitude 9.1, so definitely a big earthquake. And here's another before and after shot um, uh, around uh, Aceh in Indonesia. There's before. And there you can see all the vegetation that got removed by that wave washing inland. Um, another recent one that has happened was um, in Japan in 2011. There was a magnitude 9 earthquake. And this is the... Um, uh, tsunami arriving um, at the uh, Miyako city in Japan. There's actually a, a big wall here separating this area from, um, from the bay, but the tsunami just went right over that, and you can see it pushing all these cars around right there. Uh, the Great Chilean Earthquake, uh, that was back in 1960. Like I said, that's the largest, the strongest earthquake ever recorded, magnitude 9.5. And look what it did to Hilo, Hawaii, and these parking uh, meters that just got completely bent over. And if you visit Hilo, um, they have this, uh, this like site called the Tsunami Clock of Doom. Seriously, you can look it up on Google Maps. It's labeled the Tsunami Clock of Doom. And this is the Tsunami Clock of Doom. And uh, this uh, clock records the moment uh, it stopped working when that tsunami hit. And you can go see that in a park in uh, Hilo, Hawaii. All right, one that's a notable earthquake-induced tsunami that doesn't, it's not a place you normally would think of one happening, is Portugal, Lisbon, Portugal. And um, this was in the 1700s, so no photographs, but this was an artist's uh, rendition of this uh, wave washing on shore, and you can see it's uh, taking out all the ships that were in the harbor and so on. So, like I said, earthquakes are going to be the number one cause of tsunami, but they are not the only cause of tsunami. Other things can cause it as well, like volcanic eruptions. And um, uh, volcanic eruptions, when you have a caldera collapse, Remember, a caldera collapse is where you have this explosive eruption, empties the magma chamber, and this whole part of the land above the magma chamber sinks into it. Well, if this happens in the ocean, we're going to be moving a lot of water. Again, that's the key to making a tsunami, is move a lot of water. So, for example, in uh, the ancient world, there was this island called Thera, uh, these days it's called Santorini, and there is an eruption around 1600 BC. This used to be a complete island, right? It used to go all the way around like that. This volcano erupted, creating that caldera. And when that happened, a lot of sea uh, seawater got moved in that eruption and caldera collapse, and this created a tsunami throughout the Mediterranean region. And that's uh, where you can see it today. This is the edge, the wall of the caldera. So this whole area sank inwards in that uh, volcanic eruption. Now, volcanic eruptions can also create tsunami through large pyroclastic flows. Now, I showed you a video of a pyroclastic flow moving over the water. Well, that's because part of the pyroclastic flow is very low density, so it can float over that water. But there is a more dense part to the pyroclastic flow. So what then happens is the pyroclastic flow comes off the mountain and hits the water. That low density part can go over the water, but the high density part plows into the water and then pushes that water in front of it. And again, we're moving a lot of water if we're pushing that water and thus going to create uh, a tsunami. And then lastly, when you have volcanic eruptions, you can have explosions underwater. 
right? The volcano can erupt underwater, it can explode underwater, and so that's going to move a lot of water as well and can create a tsunami. So a great example of a tsunami that was generated in this way was in Krakatoa in 1883. The eruption of Krakatoa probably involved all three of these to generate a huge tsunami that was 30 meters high. And because we had a caldera collapse, we had large pyroclastic flows and underwater explosions. Get this big tsunami generated from that. 36,000 fatalities, and while some of those are because of the uh, pyroclastic flows, most of those are because of the tsunami that was generated in this eruption.